All right, so welcome back to part two of our connections discussion. We're going to kind of recap where we left off the last time. We were talking about um, particularly bolted shear connections, and in particular, a couple of the different failure phenomena that we could see now. We talked primarily in the last video about how to calculate the shear strength of a bolt by itself, but we never really got into the, the phenomena that we had started to discuss. And so what I want to do is I want to kind of kind of recap those and then I'll show you the AISC requirements for these two cases and then we'll kind of work through a, a complete design example that incorporates these parts and we'll start to show how we start to lay out a particular um, connection based off of just some very basic information and we'll show you that. So the two cases that we're going to be focusing on in this video will be the bearing of the bolt on the hole on the on the edge of the hole. Okay, so if I have a bolt inside of, you know, this is a, a hole in a plate, and if I have a bolt that's hanging out here and he's pushing in, you know, if the bolt is um, too small or there's not enough area of it, I can actually fail the edge of the hole and kind of, it's almost like an egg, egging of the shape. I mean, it takes a round hole and turns it kind of into an oval shape. So, so that's the phenomenon we're worried about there. This is called bearing. It's a bearing criteria of the bolt. Okay. Um, the other case that we have is more of a tearing phenomenon or what we called as the slicer phenomenon last time in which I have a bolt and generally this happens with smaller size bolts or very thin plates that if I have a very small bolt here that it basically just kind of plows its way through okay and it, it can, or I guess in theory it could rip you know these two pieces you know off or one singular big tear right down the middle it's kind of a ripping failure and we use the analogy of you know using a paper clip inside a piece of paper you know coming in and then just ripping this thing down okay and it's, it's it's a tearing failure and so there's some criteria for what we need to to be able to handle all of those all right so that kind of recaps us on where we were the last time right. so okay just flipped over here Okay, so let's start with the bearing criteria. Okay. All right, there are a couple of them, and one of them we've, we've, we've talked about, okay, but most of the bearing criteria are, um, they, they don't come into design at the very, very beginning because a lot of times I have control over the strength by changing variables associated with things like the spacing or the edge distance or the thickness of the plate. Okay, you typically like an attention connection, you won't design this before you size a member for gross shielding or size it for net fracture. Okay, these are these are all things that are easily remediable, and even with small changes, I get huge increases in capacity. So, so the three that you see on this list, uh, one we've already got a video for, that's the block shear case, okay, and, and the two the two subcases of that, okay, the edge distance requirements, you know, we'll talk about here in a second, and then of course the bolt spacing requirements as well, and so those will be all kind of issues that we'll look at, and then in addition to the the bolt bearing and the that that tearing failure that we were talking about earlier on, all right, so. The way this works, the way that we kind of start to think about this is we have to kind of understand um, the whole dimensioning, okay? And a lot of this is located in a table. Those tables I showed you in the last video, um, J3.3, will have standard hole dimensions for a bolt. Now, a bolt hole is not the same size as the bolt that goes in it for obvious reasons. I have to have room to be able to get the bolt or get the threads into a hole, okay? And so we have what we call a standard hole, okay? Or a standard oversized, you know, you know oversized hole. In which you know I have you know a certain diameter bolt and then I make the hole you know a sixteenth or a thirty second larger in order to be able to you know give you some room to work without making the connection too loose or, or sloppy as a result. So so we have standard holes which are just kind of a general oversize in all directions. But then you also get into what we call slotted holes and these are a little bit uh, more complicated and have some more stringent requirements. We won't talk a lot about these in, in this particular video, but you'll have things like the long slot or the short slot, okay? And these are actually pretty handy in situations where I need to allow for some movement in a piece, right? You know, maybe it's a very long steel member that is subjected to thermal loads that so it can expand or contract. Or if I want to emulate, you know, a roller support or something. If I had a bolt that's here, it's free to travel left or right. But, you know, the length of this is set by how much you need it to be able to freely travel or we're expecting it to travel without forcing this bolt clear over into the edge of the hole, right? Because if I get into the edge of the hole, then it becomes no different than the bearing and the and the, the slicer phenomenon that we had. I want to make sure that I have enough room that this thing can kind of drift back and forth depending on what the loads are trying to do to us. So, so they're, they're fairly handy and, and useful in that regard. Okay, all right, so 
here's what we're going to talk about first. Let's talk about the spacing and the edge distance requirements. Okay, most of these are tallied up in the in, in that table that I showed you, that J3.3. Okay, but that's using a, a recommended um, minimum value will help you establish those values. But the dimensions that we're talking about, let's just suppose I have a tension member or really any member, I guess, for that matter. But for us, just so we can kind of wrap our heads around what we're doing, let's put a, uh, you know, an axial load here pulling on this bar. And then I have you know, a series of two bolts that are in here. The labeling of this is, is that the distance measured from center to center is called the spacing. Okay. And so um, a lot of times in when we were doing staggered holes, we called this as the S dimension on there. Now, if I had you know, multiple rows and multiple holes, then we get into the case where we had, you know, we called this as S, but then the line between them we called as some G or some gauge distance. And so those are, those are all, they're both spacing values. Now, what the spacing parameter does is it allows you to put a bolt in a hole and then give you enough room between him and the next hole or the next object that's uh, in the way to be able to get a nut on it and then to be able to get the wrench on the nut. Okay, and so, or the, you know, the torque, whether it's, a, you know, an old hand wrench or whether it's, you know, you know some sort of impact hammer or something to, to help lock those things down. But it gives you enough room between them, okay? And so AIC recommends a spacing distance of 2.67 times the diameter of the bolt as a minimum, right? Now, in practice, this isn't a real convenient number, right? Because if I have a one-inch bolt, the first spacing is at 2.67. The next one would be at 5.33, and it becomes rather hard to lay this thing out. So a lot of times what we do is they go to like a like a three times bolt diameter just to make the math easy, okay? And for bolts that are less than one inch in diameter, a fairly common spacing that's used is just three inches, right? Because it's very easy to lay out for the people that are doing the fabrication, you know, you know three inches, six inches, nine inches, 12 inches, and then it repeats. It becomes a very easy dimension. But this is the actual requirement, this first one, this 2.67 times the diameter of the bolt. All right. Okay. The other dimension that we have is the edge distance. Okay. And what that is, is that if I'm pulling on this, it's the distance from the last bolt to the perpendicular edge, the shortest distance to the end of the member. Okay. And so what I want to make sure is that I have enough material here that I can establish that bearing force to be able to put the shear into the bolt. Because if this hole is clear over here next to the edge, then it's doing nothing. I could just rip it through the end of it. Okay. And so that's this edge distance. Okay. There are also edge distances between the bolt and the edge in the other directions as well. These are both edge distances as well. Even though the load's going horizontally, we still call those as an edge distance, All right? So in the next table, so we started off on J3.3 in the 15th edition, okay? In J3.4, we get into the minimum edge distance parameters, okay? And we'll show you some of those here in a second. Um, for standard holes, it's J3.4. For slots, it's J3.5, okay? Now, the maximum spacing and the maximum edge distance is a different parameter that we're kind of looking at on here. Um, and they actually put a maximum limit on it because the concern that they have on this is if this is my plate, you know, let's suppose that I put another plate directly under it. And I have my bolts. And I have my bolts again. If these, this distance, the spacing between these two bolts becomes too much, okay, there's no such thing as a smooth, perfectly planar metal surface. And trying to get to those, if I magnify this, at some level, you could end up with a gap that looks like this. You know, and then I bolt here, and I bolted here, but these surfaces don't line up perfectly, and you get these openings that exist. And what happens is, is if these things are too far apart, this opening gets too big, I can get moisture down in that connection, you know, even if I don't want it. So we want to be careful of that phenomenon because moisture leads, you know, on metal is, or steel in particular leads to rust. And then you can get a deterioration of the connection just because of this trap moisture that can kind of hide out in these connections, especially if it's exposed to the elements. Okay, and in fact, what you'll see is that the edge distances and the spacing criteria all become a factor of, you know, you know the type of the surface condition. So, so the maximum edge distance that I'm allowed to go, because, you know, this is between the bolts. At the end of the connection, you know, you can get kind of a plate that does, let's slide this over a little bit, you know, kind of the same idea, you know, and then here's my bolt. Well, those two ends don't line up perfectly, and again, that's a moisture entry point. Right, so they want to make sure that those gaps don't get too big. And, you know, there's a certain tolerances to 
to how smooth and level these plates have to be, but but that's the concern that AIC has for and why they set these parameters up. So for the maximum edge distance, okay, they're going to take it's 12 times the thickness of the part. T is the thickness of the plate that's connected, being connected, okay, and then less than or equal to six inches. So this six inches is an absolute maximum value that we have on this. All right, so six inches. So you can see that for plates up to about a half an inch, it's six inches is the maximum and then as you get larger you're still bound by six inches just because they want things to be kind of snug and tight so that's our maximum edge distance parameter our maximum spacing which is the one between the two bolts the distance is double that all right so it's 20 but but there is another criteria that if it's if we have you know a painted or you know some sort of you know non-corrosive galvanized or stainless type of steel you're allowed to use double so it's 12t here it's 24t here and if it's you know six inches max here you're allowed 12 inches max here and that's just you know because it's kind of if i go back and i look at my my connection this is you no know, kind of like it's symmetric over to the next bolt if i were to draw this thing right you know if i take this line and cut it in half half of this is the exact same phenomenon as what you're seeing here so that kind of makes some sense now I, now if you don't protect the steel if it's just raw steel or what we call weathered steel then corrosion is a serious issue they actually clamp down on the requirements and you're limited to only 14 t or a seven inch maximum. So it's almost the exact same requirement as the maximum edge distance, even though it's a spacing parameter in the middle. They're really nervous about, you know, something getting in there and corroding away the metal out from under the connection over time. Okay. All right, so, so those are the kind of the parameters that we have working for us there. So those are your edge distances and your spacing parameters. Again, those are all in those tables. It's pretty easy, uh, pretty easy reading on that. All right, the next criteria that we have is coming out is for the actual bearing strength calculations okay and this is an inequality okay it comes out of section j3.10 okay and this is for standard oversize and short slots okay and for all of these cases just like with the bolt shear strength we're going to use a phi of 0.75 all right and then the basic equation comes down to one of two questions that you have to ask okay are you concerned that if there's any deformation in this connection the connection will become you know super loose or is deformation a concern or consideration okay if it's not a slip critical connection or something like that if deformation is a concern you're limited to 1.2 lc tfu and then that's less than or equal to 2.4 dtfu the first side of this is the tearing side okay the second side of this is the bolt bearing the bolt bearing side okay and that's for if deformation is a consideration okay if deformation is not emphasis on the not a consideration then you're given a little bit of extra and the coefficients change from 1.2 to 1.5 and 2.4 to 3 as we start to kind of look now what are they looking at when they're talking about this so if i come in and i draw a basic series of connections on this okay let's just say this is one of the plates and kind of a 3d isometric view for us there okay clearly that's the t it's the thickness of the element itself and okay, now again this is a hole that goes through goes through the plate okay the lc parameter okay the d that you see if this is my hole okay and this is my bolt on here the d in that formula that you saw for the bearing side is the diameter of the bolt okay because what we're trying to measure is that as this thing pushes into the side of the hole that i want to make sure that i can establish the stress here that allows me to develop the shear strength in the, in the bolt or the pin okay that's all that we're talking about on that so it's not the diameter of the hole it's the diameter if you will of the bolt so that's the side that we saw with 2.4 DTF FU. Okay, so and so again, it's an ultimate stress that we're looking at on the on the plate of the material. Okay, the other one that we have then is broken down into: Are we an interior bolt or are we a you know a, an edge bolt? Okay, so if I have let's just for for good measure add another another bolt here. Okay, and let's say that I'm pulling on this piece, and then the bolts are located in those three holes. All right, this guy right here is an edge bolt. He's the bolt hole that's closest to the edge of the plate. This is the edge. 
okay, in the direction of the load. So again, we're looking at a line of action that's coming that way. Right? These two are interior bolts. Okay. All right. So that will hopefully give us a little bit of information on that. Now, if we go back and kind of look at this in the plan view, the way this is measured, okay, the parameters that we have of D is the bolt diameter, T is the thickness of the connected material. Hold this down here so you can still see the formulas, the original formulas. FU is the minimum tensile strength of the connected material, and then LC is this clear distance. Okay. And so, again, this one was an edge bolt. And this one's an interior bolt. Okay, for an edge bolt, LC is measured from the edge of the hole all the way out to the edge of the plate. Okay, so it's literally the material that would have to be ripped in order to be able to fail this thing or pull him through. All right, so um, now one of the problems that we have is, is that typically the dimensions that are given are given to the center line of the bolt hole, right? So what you'll have to do is you'll have to subtract off half a diameter of a bolt from that distance to get LC. Okay. Now the LC for an interior bolt, because his next neighbor is another bolt, okay, it's now the clear distance from the edge of the bolt hole to the edge of the bolt hole. Okay, so now we're taking what was, if I take this dimension and lay him up here, if that was my S, then in this case LC is going to be equal to S minus a diameter of a hole. Or more specifically, it's minus two times half diameter of a hole, right? Because on this line, I've got a half a hole here and I have a half a hole here. So that's the way that we can kind of start to work out these LC values. And so after that, it's just a matter of kind of plugging and chugging and, and calculating your numbers as you start to look at it. It's a very easy calculation, okay? But it is an inequality and your capacity is limited to the lower of the two values, on this. Now this is the formula for the long slotted hole, but it's no different for the standard oversized holes uh, based on the deformation concerns. Okay, so that's all there is really to calculating bearing strength and and our, ta our, our tearing strength for the bolt holes. Again, this is never a controlling characteristic on a design. It shouldn't be, okay, because I can always change the spacing or change an edge distance and I can increase this LC value by a tremendous amount. Now the one that you don't have a lot of control over is this side of the equation, right? Because the only variables that affect the bolt bearing are that constant value, the diameter of the bolt, and the thickness of the plate. Now the thickness of the plate is usually set by gross yielding or net fracture when you do those calculations. So your only option really is this diameter of the bolt. Okay, and that's one of the things that we have to kind of kind of be careful to look at is what kind of stress are we developing on this bolt as it tries to pull into the connection, okay? All right, All right so let's, I've got an example here, and we'll kind of work our way through this, hopefully, and kind of get ourselves set up here. Okay, so for us, what we want to do is we have just a simple double shear connection, if you will, okay, in which I'm going to say I'm going to use three-quarter inch Diameter bolts, A325. Now, I'm not calling N or X on this. That's going to be up to us to kind of figure out. Now, in practice, we talked about N as being threads included. And normally in a design, I just make everything included so that if there's a problem in the field, I don't get bit by that 20% reduction. All right, I just, I've accounted for the worst part of it, and it's kind of cheap insurance. It doesn't cost you a lot. But for the sake of this, we'll, we'll figure all that out. Okay, the bolts are in standard holes for the connection. Okay, we're going to have a minimum of two rows of bolts. Okay, and we want to figure out how many bolts and how do I arrange them such that, you know, my tension load is a dead load of seven kips and a live load of 43 kips. Okay, each of the plates is a quarter inch by 10 and they're all A36 material. So all of the three of these plates are quarter inch by 10. Okay, so if I look at this in kind of a plan view, okay, this would be the plate that's here and then this is that hidden line for him as he sits down in the middle, and then my holes are all going to locate here. If it's 2x2 two two or 3x2 two or whatever the quantity is, we've got to be able to figure that out. So all we want to do is we want to be able to figure out the quantity of the bolts and kind of their arrangement. So as you might expect, and we'll go through the first part of this fairly quickly because you guys have done this a dozen times now. All right, is the first thing we do is we factor the loads. And so for a dead load live load case, I'm going to assume that it's 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, and I plug all that in, I get a tension load on this of 77 kips factored. Okay. Now, if we go through and we look, 
we can try to figure out, well, which of these plates is going to be the one that controls, okay? And it's clearly the one in the middle because this is a double shear connection. So I have a single T value here, and then I get a half a T here and half a T there, okay? And so this guy is obviously the most heavily loaded plate, and he's the same size as the others, okay? So I know this is the guy that's going to have my issues for gross yielding and net fracture on those kind of things, all right? So this is the T that I'm designing for, because if I design all the plates the same, then this one is the one that will control, all right? Okay, so if we kind of run through this, we're going to run through our, our gross yielding and our our rupture case or our net fracture cases just real quick. Okay, so if you recall, we're going to do gross shielding, so I need the gross area, and so that's just 10 by a quarter, two and a half inches squared. The net area for two lines of bolts we know is going to be 10 inches wide minus two times the diameter of the hole. Now remember, we took the diameter of the bolt, that's this value, plus the 16th, plus another 16th. This is that extra for punching. So we've assumed a punch, uh, you know, a punch phenomenon for, for that particular hole. Remember we said, you know, that the diameter of a hole is equal to the diameter of the bolt, okay, plus a 16th plus a 16th, right? Okay, and so that's the eighth that you're seeing in that formula. All right, the first sixteenth is for damage during the, the the drilling process, and then a sixteenth extra if you punch it instead of drill it. And since we don't know, we're going to assume that it's punched, and I'll take a little bit of reduction off of that. All right, so that's my a nominal, and then again multiplied by the quarter inch. So this is two point oh six inches squared. Okay, and then for to take into account our shear lag for this particular connection, this is a flat plate. We've got two lines of bolts. It's ten inches wide. We're just going to assume that it's the stress is uniformly distributed, so we're going to take a U factor, that shear lag coefficient out of table D3.1 uh, being 1.0, and then multiplied by 2.06, it's 2.06 also. All right, so my capacities for yield and for rupture, 0.9, because this is a yield criteria, 36, 2.5, 81 kips, and then for rupture, it's 0 0.75, 58, and 2.06 times 9 is, gives you 90. So clearly the gross yielding is the guy that controls. Okay, now we know that for this particular design, that my gross yielding capacity is 81 kips and that's greater than my TU of 77. So we know that we can make this work. Now we gotta go in and start playing with the bolts. Okay, and start trying to lay this connection out. So this is, you know, this is where the new stuff kicks in. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna design the bolts for shear. Okay, now I know, you know, I typically assume included just for the sake of this exercise, I'm gonna assume that they're excluded for this calculation. This gets us a little bit more capacity. And that's one reason why you might do an X. Okay, but again, if I don't know who's doing the quality control on the job, often I'll choose this as an N. But since this is a theoretical exercise, we'll assume the guy in the field knows what he's doing, that X is okay. Okay, and that will get us a little bit more capacity. So all we're doing then is we're coming in and we're doing the shear capacity for one bolt. And that's what this formula is. Anytime you see this big R, it's a one bolt capacity. All right, so I'm going to take my phi. I'm going to multiply it by the, the allowable shear stress for our A325 bolts. I have my area bolt, and then I have this M, which is the number of shear planes, okay? And so the number of shear planes in this is, because if you remember the formula I showed you last time was for a one shear plane. So this particular connection, if you remember, is double shear, because I'm going to break it here, and I'm going to break it here. That's two shear planes to pull that guy out, so it's twice the load on him, all right, on that particular bolt. So it's a, it's a double shear connection on the bolt. And we can kind of run through our calculus. Now, this is using the calculations um, instead of using table 7-1, but it's all the same. So my FNV is 60 KSI, my M is 2, okay, my phi is 0 0.75, and my area of my bolt is pi over 4, and these are 3 quarter inch diameter bolts, so 3 quarter inch squared gets me that area. And if I do that, my phi RN is 39.8 kips per bolt. All right, sorry about that. I was looking through these numbers and realized I had a, had a typo, I misread the table. Okay, so we were saying that phi was 0.75, this is where the error was. Okay, I had it written down as 60 KSI before, but if you go look at that table uh, for the F and V value, this should have been 68 for a threads excluded, so I was cheating myself a little bit. M is still two, AB is still the same, and my phi RN is 45.1 kips. And just so you know that I'm not making this stuff up. I pulled the table as well. All right, so we're looking at a group A bolt. We're looking at threads excluded. We were looking at double shear and we were coming over to three quarter inch. That is the 45.1. So I'm pretty sure that 
my calculations are correct that time, so I apologize for that little slip up there. But all right, all right. So, so what we have then is, is that we know that one bolt is worth 45.1 kips per bolt, and if you look, we needed 77 kips here, so at least two bolts are needed on this. Okay. Now, chances are we'll probably need a whole lot more, and I'll show you how we're going to figure that out. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Okay, the first thing that we're going to check is we're going to check for bearing on the quarter inch plate. Now, just for the for the for the sake of argument, we're going to assume that the edge distance is 1.5 times the diameter of the bolt, and that the spacing is three times the diameter of the bolt. Okay, so and and again, this is the part where we're starting to kind of make things up and kind of lay things out. You know, normally. I would probably say one and a half inches and three inches, but again, we're sticking, you know, in practice, that's, those are the kind of the common values, but we're going to stick with these for now. Okay. So the first thing we're going to check is we're going to check the bearing side of the plate. Okay. Or the bearing of the bolt on the edge of the plate. And so we said that the formula that we would use for this would be phi times 2.4 FU D times T. Now, again, D is the diameter of the bolt himself. So if I plug all these numbers in for everything I know, we know phi is 0.75, there's the 2.4. FU is 58, it's three quarter inch diameter, and the plate was a quarter inch thick, that each bolt is worth 19.6 kips per bolt, okay, before I have a bearing problem on this, okay, and so that is much smaller than what you were seeing with that 45.1, so we're going to need a whole lot more bolts just to accommodate the bearing as opposed to breaking the bolts themselves, okay, so what we do is we come in and we calculate, based off of these two criterias, um, the number of bolts being as the tensile load TU divided by our limiting capacity on one bolt. Okay, so we said 19.6 and this is 77. So that tells me 3.9 bolts. And so that gets me, tells me that, well, obviously I can't have a decimal bolt value. So you always round up to the next whole number and that gets me to four. And since we had two rows, a two by two pattern is not a, not a, a bad decision. All right now, if this had been, you know, like 4.3, would you round it to five? You know, say I had a 4.3 here, would you go five bolts? Well, the question becomes, well, how do I lay that out so that I have two rows, which was the kind of the given requirement? Okay, so a lot of times we'll add just to kind of keep the pattern, you know, the pattern normal. I could accomplish two by three with six bolts, but how do you do two rows and get five bolts? So that's always a concern. But for us, we have four bolts, so two by two will be fine. Okay, all right. So now we can go in and we can start to kind of lay this thing out. I know I have four bolts. Okay. And so we know that the spacing parameters are going to affect our block shear calcs, okay, but they're also going to affect our, our tearing failure, which was the other side of that bearing equation on this. So, so now that we know the number of bolts for bearing and the number of bolts for shear strength, that's generally where you start with those two guys first, the, these two checks, because this is what's used to determine the number of bolts. It's either the lower of this guy or the lower of the shear strength that we did on the earlier page, okay? All of the other calculations that we do for the tearing failure or for block shear I can control those by changing and playing with the spacings. Okay, so for the minimum edge distance for a three quarter inch diameter bolt, we said we were going to take it as one and a half times the diameter of the bolt. So that's going to be one and a quarter inches at the sheared edges. Okay, so for our layout, if we go two by two, that would be this distance here. All right, the min spacing, which is the distance between these guys as well as the gauge distance here on here, or well, I guess potentially not necessarily the gauge, but the minimum that we would need. Okay, we said it was going to be three times the bolt diameter. So three times 0.75 gives me two and a quarter inches. And so if I wanted to be, you know, exactly dead on with the calculations, these are the dimensions I'd use. But again, in practice, these are hard to measure. Okay, and so normally I try to go to something that's a little bit more convenient, and generally I'll round these things to the nearest, you know, to the nearest half inch or to the nearest whole inch on this and like I say often what I do is I go to like you no know, one and a half for edge and three and three for spacing okay now and so it's um and again that's just kind of a fabrication deal so that the people that are out measuring it in the quality control can ensure that the things are getting done so so what I did is I went and I kind of rounded things up a little bit so instead of an inch and a quarter I decided to go ahead and say let's say this is two inches Okay, and that will be that edge distance here. And then instead of being two and a quarter from here to here, I rounded it up to three. Okay, and that's a pretty standard standard. Okay, now I do know that this plate was 10 inches wide here. Okay, and that I do have to maintain these edge distances. 
okay, which would be two inches here and two inches here, so that's four inches, leaving me with a gauge distance of six inches. Okay, and six inches is greater than my minimum, okay, so I should be okay for, for, for the spacings for those. Okay, and we also know that that's better than my, my maximums that were allowed as well. Okay, all right, so now once you have that figured out, now we can go in and start doing the strength check. So the first thing that we do is we're going to check our block shear calculation. And so we have two cases that we have to check. And again, if you need help with how block shear is handled, you know, please refer back to the video for that, the other video. Um, but for now, we know that we have one of two cases. I could either rip the corners off or I could rip the middle out. Now, if you look at this, you notice that the shear planes are exactly the same. There's the same shear plane, whether it's an A, A and V or an AGV value is the same, whether it's this piece or this piece. This is, I'm ripping the corners out, this I'm ripping the middle out. So the only difference is the difference between the, the, the normal stress portion of it, okay? So I have a six inch normal stretch portion here, and I have two plus two is four inches. This is the guy that's gonna control, right? Because this guy has a whole lot more distance that has to rip than this one would as we start to look at. So I know that's gonna be my case that starts to control as I lay this thing out, okay? All right, so let's go check our blocks here real quick. Okay, and so the way that we calculate these is that we're going to take the, our length, which was the uh, for, for the A and V. So if you look at our dimensions again, let's get these back up here where we can see. Remember, we had 2 inches and 3 inches, so the shear length is 5 inches. Okay, and then my, my, my normal distance will be 4 inches, 2 here plus 2 here. And that will get us into what we're starting to see here. So we're going to calculate the, the net area due to shear. And so that's going to be 5 minus. And so we're going to cut across 1.5 bolts. Okay, and then here's the 3 quarter plus the eighth. Multiply by a quarter, that's 1.84. Okay, and then we can go in and do our A and T, which is going to be two sections of 2 inches minus half a hole each. And so half times the 3 quarter plus an eighth times a quarter gets me to this number. All right. All right, so then all I'm going to do is I'm going to plug this into my, my, my block shear calculations. And again, this is just plug and chug. So my, my shear fracture tension yield case is this formula. If I go through and I do that, I get a value of 64 kips. And then my FU A and T value is 45.2. That's the other side of this. And then I can put my, fat, my fee factor of 0.75 onto each of these. Okay, and I can show that for each of these two terms that come up into, into those particular cases, I'm going to get a total of 75 kips capacity when I plug everything in and all is said and done. All right, now here's the problem. When I calculated my capacity was 75, the applied load is 77. So therefore, technically, we're no good. We don't have enough capacity, but we are pretty close. All right, so we need to change our spacings to buy back some capacity. So without running through the calculations, I know that because I'm only two kips off here, that if I increase this edge distance to two and a half inches from two inches, I will get more than two kips of extra capacity. So that's what we did. I just rounded to the next half inch increment. So my final pattern for laying this thing out was two and a half and three inches as my trial. So block shear is no longer a concern on this for this one. Okay. All right, so the last thing that we need to check then is our tearing failure, what our capacity is that causes these bolts to tear through and what we're affectionately calling the, the slicing phenomenon. So what I've done is I've redrawn the picture here. It's a two by two bolt arrangement as we concluded earlier. It's two and a half inch edge distance, it's three inch spacings, and then I have my two inch edge, six inch gauge, and two inch edge. Okay, and again, we assume the load was acting horizontally that way. Now, the other thing that I've listed on here is I've also determined because we have to do our calculations for edge bolts and interior bolts separately. So I've illustrated that these two are my edge bolts because they're the two that are nearest to the edge surface, right? So for every row that you have, you have to have an edge bolt, okay? Because I got to know what this distance is to make sure that he's long enough to be able to calculate it. So, so this is an edge bolt and this is an edge bolt, and then all the others will be interior bolts. So if I had multiple rows, in this case, I only have two interior bolts, but I could have four, six, eight, depending on how many I had in this pattern, okay? So, so we'll make use of that here in just a second. All right, now, for us, we're gonna assume that deformation 
is a concern and this is generally kind of a conservative you know if you don't know it's better just to assume that it is because it changes that 1.5 to a 1.2 it's a little bit smaller capacity um, so this is normally what I'll use on this unless I absolutely know for sure that it's not a concern but that's just how I typically do this recall from the beginning of the exercise that our bolt bearing capacity was 45.1 kips per bolt that was the the 2.4 DTFU value that we calculated. It's the right side of that inequality for, for our calculations. All right. So all we do is we have to go in and we have to figure out what are my LC values for an edge bolt and an interior bolt. So LC for the edge bolt then is going to be, if you look at it, it's going to be, remember, that's the material that you have to tear to pull this thing through. So it's going to be two and a half inches and that's a center line dimension. Okay. So I'm going to subtract off half a hole to get me to my LC value. And that's what we did. So two and a half inches minus one half of my hole diameter, which was seven eighths. And so I have an LC dimension of 2.06 inches. So then the capacity that it takes to tear one of these bolts through that distance is 1.2 times LC times the thickness of the plate times 58 KSI, which is 35.8 kips per bolt. Okay. So now if I put the fee factor on it, there's my 0.75. I get a total of 26.9 kips per bolt. And this is also per bolt. Okay, but remember, this was part only one part of the inequality. I have to compare that to that bolt bearing number. And so I took 26.9 is less than 45.1. So I take the smaller of the two. So my capacity for the edge bolts is limited by the tearing failure, and that's 26.9 kips per bolt. Okay. All right, do the same thing for the interiors then, and except now the spacing was three inches, and then minus two. Um, time, so now if you look at the picture again we're doing center to center and I need the distance that's the actual material so I have a half a hole here and a half a hole here so it's LC minus 2 times half a hole which is what I've done and so that distance is 2.125 so it's actually very similar in number a little bit longer okay and so then my RN value on this plugging into the formula 1.2 2.125 the thickness FU and that gets me to 37 kips per bolt, just a little, just a, a hair, hair larger, um, not much. You can see I gained almost a, a kip per bolt just by increasing that thing by, what is that, about a sixteenth? So it doesn't take much to start adding capacity to these things by increasing these things, uh, increasing those distances just a little bit. Okay, so then I put the fee factor on like I did before, 0.75 times that gets me 27.8. And again, we're bound by that upper limit of the bolt. Okay, which is 45.1, and so my VRN for the interior bolts is 27.8. Okay, so the last calculation I do is figure out, well, how much is this whole connection worth in capacity, all right? And so the way that we do that is I take my VRN for the entire connection, or my total, if you will, and I take the number of edge bolts times the capacity of an edge bolt, plus the number of interior bolts times the capacity of an interior bolt. So I had two of each. In this but sometimes you don't sometimes you have three edges and six interiors or, or more depending on how you've arranged these bolts and laid them out so it's 2 times 26.9 plus 2 times 27.8 gets me a total capacity of 109.4 kips for this connection the way that I have it laid out with those spacings okay and that's greater than my applied load of 77 again that was TU so we're okay for tearing we're pretty good on, on the design on that so anyway I hope that um, clarifies how you do bolt bearing and uh, tearing failures as well as kind of how we start to kind of lay out the patterns and you know, you look, you're looking for convenient numbers of arrangements of bolts again we needed four bolts and I knew I needed two rows or I had room for two rows so I could you know I just chose two by two you know but sometimes it's not that easy you know maybe you have a single you know you know you know a single angle and like an L4 by four well maybe I can only get one line well then all of a sudden these bolt connections start getting very very long as we start to kind of look at that so you're always kind of you're almost being creative trying to figure out how do I get these in you know because I don't want these connections to get too long because then I need a really big gusset plate on the back side of this thing or or it's just it's just not a real convenient um, you know detailing issue otherwise so it's you know we want to try to keep connections fairly compact but I do have to be checking all of these things the the, the thing that you gain on and on one line is for the same four bolts, I would have had three interior bolts and one edge bolt. But when I went to two, it was two and two. But if I had gone to, you know, four by one, then they would all be edges and there would be no interior. So you got to kind of track what's interior and what's, you know, what's considered as an edge when you start to do these calculations. So 
Anyway, I'm, that about does it for this particular exercise. Um, as always, if you've got any questions or comments, please uh, please leave some feedback down below in the comments below the video. Um, if there's anything we can do to make it better, please let us know that as well. Okay, um, as always, like and subscribe to our channel, and we will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Happy engineering.